So our next speaker is Dr. Rachel Schultz. She is an associate professor of wetland science in the environmental science and ecology department at SUNY Brockport. Broadly interested in how plant communities influence ecosystem functions and services in wetlands and studies wetland restoration and evaluates outcomes on multiple scales. Um, her current focus is on Great Lakes coastal wetlands and she oversees monitoring and research on wetlands along Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. She's a member of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Adaptive Management Ecosystem Technical Team and has been involved with phase two of plan, the Plan 2014 expedited review. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schultz. Um, I'm gonna go over a brief review of Great Lakes coastal wetland and of course, upper St. Lawrence River uh, wetland ecology, which should be you know, well in your old wheelhouse. It'll just be a review. I'll introduce the Plan 2014 expedited review phase two um, including ecosystem PIs that are relevant to the upper river. And then I'll focus on the vegetation PIs um, for specific area, Eel Bay, um, which I first um, came to study in 2003. A little bit about me. Um, I used to call myself a Midwestern mutt, but I've transitioned to um, calling myself having, having Great Lakes connections. Um, I have studied in almost all of the Great Lakes watersheds except for Lake Huron. And relevant to this talk, I came to study Lake Ontario wetlands in 2003 when I was a lowly uh, field tech as part of the uh, Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River study in 2003 with Drs. Doug Wilcox and Jim Meeker. I then did a bunch of stuff <laughs> and came back as an associate professor of wetland science at SUNY Brockport. And here is where I've really um, been focusing on Great Lakes coastal wetlands and um, their restoration and improving their restoration. Now this says Lake Ontario wetland dynamics, but of course this extends to the upper river. Um, and this is, a, um, this is an aerial photograph of Flynn Bay from around 2001. Of course, you all know where we are, but when we talk about Great Lakes coastal wetlands, we are talking about the entire basin. And these are all wetlands that are influenced by a Great Lakes uh, rise and fall of their water levels. And we can see over here by the St. Lawrence River, we have an immense cluster of wetlands, uh, which is, is higher than many areas um, along the different Great Lakes. And uh, what is still important to note, however, is that we have lost approximately 50% of wetland area across the Great Lakes Basin. And so I am biased here, but every one of those wetlands is precious in terms of the amount of ecosystem services and resources they provide. This is a graphic from Michigan Sea Grant, but I love it because it also has animals in there and people like to look at other things besides plants. I have come to realize. Uh, but this this particular graphic shows the different zones of vegetation and structure that our Great Lakes coastal wetlands have, from the forest to the shrubs to the wet meadow, which I'll be focusing on a lot, the emergent zone, and then our submergent zone here. Uh, but what to, I want you to keep your eyes on here is that the, the highs and the lows of any Great Lake essentially are corresponding to the different zones of wetland vegetation, and in fact, their actual extent. So here's the high water level here, and here's our low water level here, and here's our wetland zone. So if the fluctuations go greater or less, that also corresponds to the extent of wetland area that we have on a Great Lake. And so this is how it works. Um, this is from Maynard and Wilcox in 1997, which showed that during times of high water levels, of course, 2017, 2019, we experienced this on Lake Ontario, 
the water levels come up and our shrubs die back, our emergence die back, our um, other types of vegetation as they get flooded out and we get an expansion of aquatic communities. And then as the water levels come down, we start to see a regrowth of both emergent and these grasses and sedges that we call wet meadow or meadow marsh. And that continues as the water levels recede until we see high waters return again. And it is this process of the water levels rising and falling that lead to us having this zonation. If water levels were stagnant, we would just have something like a pond, like shrubs next to submergent aquatic vegetation. It is this rise and fall that creates these dynamic wetlands. Which brings me to Lake Ontario. Um, so I have not coined this term. This is um, the cattailization. Um, this comes from H.P. Odom, um, a, uh, an ecologist from the 70s. Um, and he was noting this cattailization of wetlands across North America. But of course we did, um, in looking at wetlands um, in Lake Ontario and also the upper St. Lawrence, when we look at this first part of the, the, century, the 19th century here, um, this is Eel Bay. Um, and so this is of course about five miles um, as the crow flies just to the north and east of here. And um, if we were to look at the aerial photography from the 1950s and the 1960s, we can see that this meadow marsh area, this area with sedges and rushes, uh, was actually quite prevalent. It was perhaps more than 26% of the overall area um, prior to regulation. And cattail, cattail um, is a number of different species, but we're just gonna call it cattail for right now. Right now. Um, this had always been in the marsh, but a little, a little less than um, the meadow marsh area. So we see here um, in, the, in the 1960s, we do have a low water period here. But after that point, we really missed having any of those low water conditions um, following, following the installation of the Moses Saunders Dam. And at the same time, as time went on and the lows were missing and we see that lowering of the overall um, degree of fluctuation, we see a corresponding loss of meadow marsh vegetation, a little bit of an uptick here in 2001, while cattail be, has become dominant here. Um, and this is from photo interpretation. And what's happening here is that essentially you have uh, what's been called the Lake Ontario squeeze, where um, you have your cattails here, a very competitive, robust plant um, that is able to thrive up here where it used to not be able to. And you have shrubs that are here due to a relatively um, stagnant, well, less fluctuating water level. And the meadow marsh, this diverse wet meadow area is squeezed in between uh, and has very little left in terms of a range. And so a big push, of course, for a change in the water level regulation plan from plan 1958 DD to plan 2014 uh, had to do with how creating a more natural level of fluctuation could help to restore these wetlands that had become choked with cattail. And so the idea was that you have the, the increase in water level, um, natural fluctuations, a decrease in cattail, um, an increase in pike that use the, the um, meadow marsh vegetation, and um, also muskrats coming back due to the changes. But of course, uh, these were hypothesized to happen when the, the plan went into effect um, in 2017, but we still need to know where we're at in terms of the goals seven years after the plan was enacted. 
So uh, that gets me into the second part of my talk, which has to do with what is the valuation that's happening now. So the, um, I'm, I, these are actually straight slides from the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee, um, which is a, an advisory group to the um, International uh, Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board, um, as well as, of course, the board um, influencing or uh, uh, underneath the, the International Joint Commission itself. And the International Joint Commission is there to uphold the Great Lakes uh, water quality agreement uh, between the US and Canada. And so where I'm at uh, is a technical group under the GLAM committee that um, helps to give recommendations to the board about potential alternatives to the current regulation plan. Now with, as you well know, with plan 2014 came um, at the same time, um, historic high water levels uh, that were not included in the original plan formulation. And so this spurred a initial evaluation of um, of the regulation plan to be able to respond to these high water events. So in the phase one of the expedited review, the focus was on this decision to support tool for the board to use um, to say, okay, if, you know, depending on the outflow, this is what the impacts are going to be on which communities and have that inform their decisions. We're now in phase two which is to actually evaluate and rank regulation plan alternatives, whether they be minor or major uh, changes from plan 2014 based on what we call performance indicators. I know this is a little much on this slide, so I'm just gonna go through it. Um, so these are the expedited review components. These are how they all fit together. But essentially you have uh, the hydro meteorology, so thinking about just the net supply of, um, of, the, of the basin, so the physical parameters. And then you have the uh, thinking about what are the plan alternatives. And then I wanna focus here on this IC system, which is the integrated socioeconomic and environmental system this is an integrated modeling framework that essentially has multiple layers, multiple models that are put together. And I'll show this a little bit more clearly on the next slide. But essentially what the IC system is able to do is it's able to calculate these performance indicators of, of um, you know, the physical ramifications of changing a, um, a water regulation plan what those effects would be on socioeconomic factors, um, as well as the environmental impacts. And then those results then go into uh, visualization and analysis. So how does that, what do these results from the IC system look like? How do they compare to the, the shared vision of, um, of the IJC and um, how it affects the constituents? Uh, also, it goes into this plan optimization system. So basically, um, what makes, what optimizes these performance indicators overall, depending on their weights, and then also informs that decision support tool that I just talked about that the board uses to make its outflow regulation um, decisions. Okay, so this is what I see looks like. Uh, where you have the inputs of flow and water levels under a certain plan or plan alternative. Then you have these multiple spatial layers. So you have elevation here, um, hydrodynamics, including wave action, and um, geospatial data sets, including uh, wetland area, but also, of course, urban and other, um, other land cover types. 
Then that's all used to calculate what the level of a performance indicator would be. And then you have outputs of the actual um, performance indicator results. It's going to make a little bit more sense when I tell you what these performance indicators are. But essentially, these are uh, more positive or more negative um, impacts to a particular performance indicator and also can produce maps, depending on what the indicator is. OK. So my, I should say that I am not a modeling expert, but it's important to understand that piece. That's been very important for me as a field ecologist to understand how my, it's not necessarily my data, but the data that I help collect, how that translates into these different decisions. And it's all through these, these um, integrated models. So um, I, I want to, of course, acknowledge um, the, the, the people who are on the, this ecosystem's technical team who have been working very hard to um, come up with performance indicators that are valuable to this decision process. Um, and we can see on the US side, uh, uh, we are led by Scudder Mackey. Um, and we also have John Farrell, who many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with. He's at SUNY ESF. He's a, um, of course, a fish and, and um, all around wetland expert. Um, and then we have also Janet Lantry um, from the DEC, who is a fish specialist working with us. Huh. Our list looks a little slim compared to the Canadians, as you may notice. Um, Matthew, yep. <laughs> Matthew Wendell is on the Canadian side. Uh, this is led by Marianne Backhand um, in Quebec City and has um, several people from uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service as well as the, um, oh man, it's the, it's the hydrodynamic team, um, but many people from Environment um, and Climate Change Canada, um, as well as um, the DFO and the River Institute. So getting, getting closer to this idea of these PIs that drive this process, uh, there were an initial 400 PIs that were developed for Plan 2014. <laughs> yes, I'm seeing faces. This is a lot. Uh, and so uh, the, that original list was reduced to 32, which were then used to formulate Plan 2014. Uh, there's been additional PIs added since, but when I, when I got on the ecosystem technical team, we essentially had a list of 48 PIs that we were working down to winnow down to something that was more manageable um, so that you could, that it wouldn't be in a wash in terms of how all of these um, panned out. So we currently have a list of 14 for all study areas and I'm gonna show you what the ones are for um, the upper St. Lawrence here in a second. But first I want to show you what the process was. This wasn't willy-nilly, we're not like throwing a, a, a dart at the dartboard here, um, but rather we wanted to go through expert review to be able to winnow down the PIs to best represent, uh, first of all, sensitivity to changing water levels. So that's, we want something that's actually going to be sensitive to the decisions that are going to be made. And specific to that, we wanted to focus on what's called the natural flow regime, which means we're not necessarily just looking at, okay, what are the highest highs and the lowest lows, uh, which is magnitude, but also what is the frequency of a particular water level? What is the duration of either flooding or low water conditions? What is the timing of it? Is it in winter? Um, is it in the growing season? And also any rate of change that happens in terms of water level change. And we wanted those to tie into uh, how ecosystems would be uh, more towards their reference state, okay? So pre-regulation. We wanted to have actual data that we could use to validate the, the performance indicator, um, that there be some available models or at least expertise, that 
it, these could be umbrella indicators. That one indicator could potentially represent other species and other ecosystem functions. Ecological sensitivity, so different um, aspects about life history, patterns, connectivity that again also relate to um, the integrated nature of the ecosystem and also its response to those water level changes. Um, its significance to um, socioeconomic, ecological indigenous communities, um, that it essentially stand out as something that people find significant and meaningful. Any conservation status of a species and if there were any um, long-term monitoring of these data. So here they are for the upper uh, St. Lawrence at this time. And uh, I believe there's eight up there. Um, over here, you'll notice, so, so this is the species or group. This is the modeled component. Essentially, this is um, the number that you get or whatnot, the geography. Uh, this is whether or not it's useful for evaluating deviations to a particular plan. And last, is this a legacy PI used for plan 2014 or is it a new PI? So for the upper St. Lawrence, we have four legacy PIs and four new performance indicators. And so the first one, and I'm gonna talk about um, a few of these individually, but uh, I'm gonna talk about the wetland meadow marsh community, the northern pike, and the muskrat, and the timing sensitivity of fish, um, and the uh, coastal wetland response model. So when we think about restoration and our goals, we want to think about what is, what is meaningful? What should we see if something is, if an ecosystem is improving? And when we think about that, at least in terms of um, the limited set that I'm going to be going into, we would wanna see in response to a water level regulation plan that is improving environmental conditions, uh, we would wanna see an increase in meadow marsh area. We would wanna see improved survival probability and how to habitat suitability for northern pike who of course depend on access to the meadow for spawning, and also um, an increased probability of muskrat lodge um, viability, for example, that they're able to live through the winter. Here's the Meadow Marsh Community Index, and this is, um, this is what's called a, a legacy PI. So this was used um, to formulate the original plan 2014. And um, it essentially uses uh, water level data to predict the, the hectares of meadow marsh that you get from a particular regulation plan due to the response of wet meadow to those drawdown periods following a high water level. So we can see here that we have uh, different levels of, these are hectares here, and these are years on the bottom. And so this is plan 2014, and this is the hectares of meadow marsh changing over the different years depending on the, the water level fluctuations. So during high water level years, for example, we would expect to see a decrease in meadow marsh area, and under low water levels following that drawdown, we would expect to see this increase in meadow marsh area. The coastal wetland response model is a new model, and uh, this, is, this is different from the wet meadow indicator in that it maps uh, different classes of wetland vegetation across the entire basin and the upper St. Lawrence. So instead of just looking at meadow marsh, you also have submerged aquatic vegetation, emergent marsh, and swamp areas. So instead of just looking at one component of the wetlands, now we have a spatial, um, uh, you know, this, this uh, two-dimensional uh, model that can show the, the wetland change over time. 
And this is important because this is used as an import, input for um, other indicators used for fauna, for example, for northern pike. So we can look at this. This is Eel Bay. Um, and we have here, this is, um, this is the different types of wetlands, so open water, submerged in vegetation, emergent marsh, wet meadow. This is swamp and upland. And so the, the model is able to predict for a given year, depending on its water level um, that prior year, uh, where you would see these different wetland areas, and also you can get an extent of those areas as well. And what they've found, so we actually have real data that can be put in to validate this model and test it, and the accuracy score for the upper St. Lawrence was 82%. So when the model popped out a spatial uh, wetland model like this, it was right 82% of the time, whether this was submerged vegetation, emergent marsh, wet meadow, et cetera, which is very good, it's very good at doing what it does. Many of you are interested in fish. I am not a fish expert, um, but I know that it's very important and I um, am involved in many studies that involve fish, um, particularly because um, especially the Northern Pike is um, tied very closely to the wet meadow community that it uses to spawn. And so we have um, an indicator that is specifically about the habitat availability for pike and also the, the young of year abundance of northern pike um, that is, of course, representing its recruitment. And uh, so the, the pike is, of course, a symbol um, of of Lake Ontario, Upper St. Lawrence wetlands. Um, it is a sport fish, it is a top predator, it influences the fish community. Uh, so all of these different factors make it an essential uh, performance indicator for um, looking at these different plans. Timing sensitivity of fish communities is a new performance indicator and this is different than the others in that um, there's not necessarily a target number or something like that that can be evaluated, but rather this produces um, a calendar of sorts whereby you can see different fish spawning windows and how they correspond to water level, air temperature, water temperature, um, and you can look at what um, species may be sensitive to water level changes at what particular time. And so thus can very much help with decisions that are made uh, for deviations, for example, which, which fish are going to be negatively or positively affected by this particular decision. Muskrat, uh, these are, uh, this is from the original um, legacy PIs. Um, and muskrat, uh, this is like a small yet mighty um, mammal in terms of thinking about our wetlands. Uh, these are an abundant species overall in terms of their populations, but they have um, a very important role to play in Great Lakes coastal wetlands in that they are an ecosystem engineer. And what they do is they eat out sections of particularly cattail. They really do love cattail. They eat out these particular sections and they create these little pockets of open water that are so essential for biodiversity and other um, fauna to take advantage of. But they were particularly sensitive to low water conditions during the winter season when they can be more vulnerable to um, predation. And so this PI particularly looks at uh, lodge viability and also um, there's two models here the active houses and their potential loss due to water level variations during that, that crucial winter time. So this one is particularly interesting in that um, it's one of the few winter uh, PIs to look at water level changes. Okay, I'm getting into Eel Bay. 
specifically here now. Um, and I want to zoom in and look at Eel Bay over the last uh, 20 or so years and how it's changed and uh, some, some takeaways from what we've been seeing from Eel Bay from a vegetation standpoint. I know there's a lot going on in this slide, so I'll walk you through it. But um, I call this the, the view from above. So one way of studying wetlands is to interpret aerial photography of a wetland and to look at what um, the different vegetation of the wetland is. Here we have um, a study from 2018 that looked at Eel Bay from 2001 to 2014. Here in black, is that meadow marsh area hatched is cattail, gray is mixed emergent, and this light gray is submerged aquatic vegetation. This over here is the percentage of meadow marsh relative to the entire wetland ecosystem. So here in 2001, uh, Eel Bay was down to 1.41%. Um, of its area being meadow marsh compared to approximately 26% in the 1950s. In 2014, that dropped to 0.06% here with a reduction in these areas that had been larger in 2001. And in 2018, using hyperspectral analysis, uh, Army Corps researchers got, um, had this down to 0.01%. Um, of, the remain, of the area of Eel Bay uh, being wet meadow. So again, just continually seeing that decrease in meadow marsh area. But we also did field surveys. So this is another main way of being able to map wetland area and get a sense of vegetation communities. And so here I just have the mapping that was done in, 20, in 2001 in the background. Um, this, I don't know what color that is. It's like seafoam green um, is meadow marsh. And these were the field surveys that were done in 2012, 2014, and 17 by the New York Natural Heritage Program and by SUNY Brockport in 2023. Here's um, us in these, these colors, and I'll come back to that. But this particular type of field survey used these transects that went from high to low elevation and collected um, cover of individual species at 20 centimeter increments uh, along this particular transect. And I just wanted to note that um, one of the transects, it looks like two of the transects did, did get one of these sedge meadow areas in, um, in the transect. Okay, so this is what it looks like uh, when we go out there. So, uh, so oftentimes we do come from the water. This is my student, um, Adelia, and this is um, our technician, Grace. And they go out there in a canoe and access a particular location or elevation using a real-time kinematic um, GPS unit. They get a specific elevation and then they pull out this um, 0.5 by one meter quadrat that they then get the cover of specific vegetation species within, and they, they calculate that. So I wanted to show you the results from field sampling because it tells a little bit of a different story than the photo interpretation. On the right-hand side, we see the results from New York Natural Heritage Program. And here, they really found relatively stable levels of meadow marsh, here depicted in this orange, here. But they basically found meadow marsh all along the, the, the um, wooded edge and in this western lobe over here. And really, that was pretty much constant. And then this in the pink is cattail here. But that was relatively constant, even, even though you had uh, vastly different water levels across those years. And also in 03, 14, and 23, we found a rare species of sedge, rare to New York, uh, Car Carex atheroides, 
um, throughout those different time periods. That species was not lost. Uh, <laughs> this is putting uh, the different coverages of all the plant sampling that was done into different, um, into functional guilds. Um, and so this is meadow marsh, this is non-persisting emergent, Phragmites, submerged vegetation, shrub, cattail, and upland. And so we have 2012, 2014, 2017, and 2023. Cattail dominated this middle um, elevation for um, really 2012, 2014, and then you see this high level of shrub coverage in the upper elevations, particularly in 2014 and 2017. But in 2023, we see this huge uptick in meadow marsh coverage um, in our most recent sampling. Now, story is a little bit more complicated um, in that the um, the meadow marsh here, well, the sampling went from the upland to these newly built channels um, that I believe the Nature Conservancy and Ducks Unlimited had put in near to the, the wooded edge. And so it was a little bit of a different sampling um, that would have been done than in the previous years. So a little unclear on whether the restoration or the water level change had anything to do with that per, um, proportion. Here is what the um, CWRM um, shows in terms of when we put the uh, information in to the coastal wetland response model, this is what we see in terms of change with water level change. And uh, you can particularly see a response of the um, submergent aquatic vegetation, but less so for the, the meadow marsh um, community up at the top or the swamp. And something that I wanna mention with this particularly is that the CWRM is being continuously updated with field data. This is something that can and is being validated and changed with field data that is inputted um, each year. Okay, so in terms of future directions, uh, of course the, the GLAM will evaluate uh, plan 2014 as well as other options in spring and summer of this year. U.S. wetlands in Lake Ontario and Upper St. Lawrence will be surveyed again in, 20, in this summer. My student Adelia is looking at the effects of removing cattail from upper elevations on how that influences invasive plant dominance in meadow marsh. Uh, Future and current field data is continually being um, put into that coastal wetland response model. Um, however, future vegetation surveys, those field studies is unclear. I have a contract through 2024 and it is unclear how future studies would be funded. So here's some takeaways. Uh, first of all, uh, we are seeing that Great Lakes ecosystems are sensitive to water level fluctuations. And even, uh, well, and obviously when looking at water level regulation plans, we wanna see specifically what means the most to changes in water level fluctuations. And so we're looking at those data. We are not assuming that these changes are going to happen simply because they were hypothesized. We need data to actually see what's happening. And the only way we can really do that is with long-term monitoring to be able to capture different changes that may happen on different timescales. So in terms of the assessment in the Upper St. Lawrence, there's going to be those eight indicators that will be um, put into plan evaluation. Now, um, we have the, the, ecosy the, sorry, the ecosystem technical team is at the table 
and will be instrumental at setting weights for certain indicators and in how uh, different plans are given weight um, depending on their environmental impacts. Now, something that I didn't tell you, <laughs> but Eel Bay was one of 32 wetlands that was, sam that was sampled in um, Canada and the US just this past year. Um, and I showed you that increase in meadow marsh proportion that we couldn't necessarily tease apart from restoration. But we saw that basin wide. We saw an increase in proportion of meadow marsh, likely due to low periods in 2021. Now, Eel Bay's meadow marsh may, uh, remained relatively constant from 2012 to 2017 from field studies, which um, occurred because we weren't able to see. So basically, it retreated into under the canopy. Um, and uh, what's important there is to remember that we might want to use some of these remote sensing techniques, but if we want to look at something that may be obscured, like meadow marsh, we need to have on the ground field surveys to get to that. And just in terms of Eel Bay specifically, I think this would be a great area to um, look at not only for vegetation, but also for fish spawning with those channel excavations to see how that changes over time. Okay, and with that, um, I have many people to acknowledge. Um, the funding that I received came from the IJC through the Army Corps of Engineers, the GLAM committee chairs, Chris Warren and Wendy Legere, at SUNY Brockport, Adelia Baker, Grace Dowdle and Dan Beers helped with field work, the technical leads of the GLAM ecosystem technical team, Canadian Wildlife Service, I work very closely with Greg Gravis and Joe Fiorino. Uh, and then at the um, Environment Climate Change Canada, uh, I work very closely with um, Dominic, Dominic Thoreau. And then um, this, this work, much of the foundation wouldn't be complete without um, Drs. Wilcox and Meeker, who are my mentors and from New York Natural Heritage Program, Tim Howard and his team. With that, I am open for questions. How much time do I have? I, I go into a zone. Okay. I think Scott had a question. Yeah, that, 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 was, was um, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, just a point of clarification that Eel Bay restoration site was done by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. In partnership with ESF, DEC, and the Park. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that because we, my, my team got there and was like, what you know they had all these transects you know and then they they got there and their their imagery updated and we weren't way, aware about the restoration <laughs> yeah, we didn't collect any negative data i will say that we were just surprised Oh boy. Okay, I'll just take the first one first. No, I, um, so for Eel Bay, uh, when I was in discussions about what I might present for this talk, uh, John Peach mentioned that people, you know, right here, we could probably, if we really squinted, we could see um, Eel Bay from here. So it'd just be a very relevant wetland site to talk about. Eel Bay, so from the, from the greater perspective, why was it one of the 32 um, in terms of being studied from 2003? Um, it was um, selected because it's what's called an open embayment. Um, so one of the hydrogeomorphic types where it's more exposed to wave action, essentially. 
So there's four hydrogeomorphic types, the open embayment, protected embayment, the barrier beach, and the um, drowned river mouth. So it was one of the um, hydrogeomorphic types, and it uh, was selected again when um, there was a random selection of wetlands um, by the New York Natural Heritage Program, and it was in then too. So it was, it's a good representation of a particular wetland type. I am delaying because I have no idea how to answer the second part of the question. Um, that would be a question for the hydrodynamics team. So there's a whole hydrodynamics team that has been working on this physical model of Lake Ontario and the, the other associated regions. So I would <laughs> I just have, I'm gonna punt that, sorry. Yes, now this is an excellent question. So we talk so much about cattail, why don't we talk more about Phragmites? Well, um, in terms of Lake Ontario, uh, the, the story's been more that the cattail thrive better in higher uh, water conditions. And other lakes were experiencing low water conditions at the same time where um, sediment was exposed. And so lakes Michigan, Huron, um, they have huge expanses of Phragmites where the, the sediment was exposed and you had the propagules go in there and they came up. So th that's the sense that essentially um, we didn't have those extended periods of lows that would have exposed the, that sediment to Phragmites. We still have it, but it's more patchy right now. And also in New York, I feel like it's been targeted for um, eradication. Like they see it on a, on a coastal wetland and the DEC particularly is very responsive to going out there and um, herbiciding it and removing it. So there's a couple things going on there, but it's not as expansive in the Great Lakes coastal wetlands that we survey on Lake Ontario. I don't see anyone in Ontario dealing with it very much. Ah. <laughs> well, that, um, I am, I am not as familiar with um, the response on the Canadian side to Phragmites proliferation on those wetlands. That, okay, I'm gonna ask them next time I talk to them. Right, so cattail is fascinating. It is very um, uh, adapted. So what we mostly see on Lake Ontario in the upper St. Lawrence is uh, this hybrid cattail, the Typha X glauca. And it not only is good at moving inland during high water conditions, but it also creates floating mats. So it actually builds a um, floating system of its roots and detritus and then it just, it can have a living parts that extend out. And it, so it's independent of, it doesn't have to be rooted in the sediment. And so we've seen that time and time again. So it goes both directions, essentially. It has, it has limits, right? But if you're seeing something going towards your dock, it's probably maybe that floating um, component if it's in deeper water. 